Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the first interview in our new series, Redefining Trust. In today's show, we're going to discuss the blog post that we just did on aviation finance and the complexities around that process and how it can be streamlined to mitigate financial loss by using smart contracts in blockchain technology. Um, I am your host, Mason Burkhalter, and my guest today is Eric Dylas. Eric, thanks for joining. Uh, before we dig in, I, I'd like to start by just kind of getting a brief intro on who you are, your area of subject matter expertise uh, in this field of aviation finance. Sure. So I'm an attorney based in Washington, D.C., and for the last about four years, I've been working for uh, Vetter Price, which is a, a global law firm, but we're especially well known for secured finance and aviation finance. And in terms of subject matter expertise, I've I've been on deals, regulatory matters, um, various uh, legal undertakings related to aviation finance uh, pretty much constantly for the last four years. We represent everyone in the chain. We represent lenders. We represent lessors. We represent airlines. We represent, you know, the whole the whole spectrum. And from deal sizes that are as small as, um, you know, a life light helicopter or two to a billion dollar securitization of, of commercial airliners. Wow. Okay. Definitely. So this article kind of walks us through the process of purchasing a high value mobile asset, right? Like a commercial airliner. Uh, but Eric, why don't you give us a brief like ELI five really quick about that overarching process, the complexities inherent in that process and, and so on and so forth. Definitely. So uh, hopefully I can do a good Eli I, Eli I five. Yeah. On, on this as it's really the, the structure that brought me into the smart contract world to begin with. So one of the, the complex, but very typical structures of, of these transactions, if you have a, a, a large uh, commercial aircraft, um, you know, so Boeing 737, Airbus A320, um, all the way up to a 777 uh, A380, the wide body aircraft where you have the two aisles, the massive long distance haulers. And, you know, uh, most airlines, uh, they lease their aircraft. They, they don't own. They, they, they lease them from a lessor entity who's collecting rent from the airline. Um, and with this sort of tri-party system, you have a lot of complexity. So you have a lot of different incentives. You have a lot of different jurisdictions because these aircraft are flying all over the world. And the aircraft are among the most regulated items um, in existence, really, because they're, you know, for, ob for obvious reasons. So a typical international aviation finance transaction where you're, um, you know, you're, there's an aircraft or a fleet of aircraft uh, being bought and sold and on the back end financed. So the the purchaser gets a loan for the, the purchase of the aircraft. Um, there are a lot of moving parts and there's a lot of very, um, you know, specific financing calculations. There's a lot of very intricate uh, local regulatory issues where the aircraft is registered, where it's allowed to fly. Uh, tax considerations when title is passed, tax considerations for fuel usage. There's a lot of moving parts. And, um, you know, there are a lot of attorneys involved when it's a typical tripartite deal, like lender, lessor, um, airline. Each one has its own external counsel. Each has its own internal counsel. Each has its own accountant. Um, every, they, they all have to talk to the local regulatory authorities. It is a, it is a, huge undertaking and and deservedly so like um you know the the wide body aircraft i mentioned earlier one of those is in the hundreds of millions so of dollars um so you know there there's just there's a lot going on and as you might expect there's a lot of friction in there and cost yeah yeah absolutely it's actually um it's like a perfect segue into my next question to uh you know one of the central themes in the article is this idea of like principal agent problems and these are problems just for you know the audience here. They're problems that arise when one or more parties that um, are involved in in some sort of a transaction or process um, have like differing interests or incentivizations to like um, do their job, right? And um, you know, in, in this instance, one of the things that um, we kind of pointed out was like the various ways that principal 
agent problems can kind of come about and how those become increasingly problematic when it's such a like high risk, high value type of a, a transaction. So um, what can you say, like just to kind of summarize some of the basic examples of principal agent problems that like you've seen in this process? Um, yeah. Um, you know, there's the principal agent problem is all about incentives and it's all about, you know, what, like how our interests align. So, and what duties you might have um, to the principal as the agent or, you know, pertinent there. So there are a lot of uh, obvious third party trust um, agents of a principal issues. You know, you have, you can have escrow agents um, that, that kind of facilitate the transfer of money and, and, um, you know, registration and filing formalities um, but the, the the most obvious is that these these three parties to the common international um, aviation finance deal, the lender, lessor, and lessee airline, they're they're all adverse and they have their own incentives. And especially for the airline, um, if the aircraft that's being bought and sold is going to be leased to the same airline the whole the whole time, so um, it doesn't interrupt the lease contract, they're they're only incentivized as much as they're required to be under the documents to which they're a party. So that, that can be an issue. Um, obviously, when you have local regulatory authorities, they're not incentivized to, uh, you know, get you to closing as fast as possible to shave off some basis points or to, you know, facilitate an end of quarter deal, things like that. Um, and then, you know, anytime you're using uh, another third party software or, or, other way to kind of facilitate the deal and 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 things after the deal, the servicing of the of the documents. You, it's it's just an additional layer of issues that can arise, and and then following that, costs that can arise. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's it's crazy. Like uh, just to kind of even consider, right? Like people just doing their job. Um, there's nothing wrong with what they're doing, but it's it's not aligned with like what you might. Uh, need right now, right? Or what is ideal for you? Um, I think that's kind of like the main call out that that we were really trying to kind of push in that. Um, just out of curiosity, like, you know, what is like kind of a, a ballpark of like the level of expense that can really come out of, you know, these kind of problems where, you know, let's say considering a situation like needing to rene renegotiate the financials um, in, in like the contract negotiation because of some event or or whatever the case may be. Yeah, I mean, there there are so many things that can can go awry or um, you know un, unforeseen circumstances occur during the course of a, a deal's negotiation and then like heading towards closing. So. Um, you know, the thing to remember is, uh, you know, th these, again, the, the three party um, deal that's going on here, transaction, each of them have their own external counsels, um, whether that's attorneys, um, accountants, you know, tax specialists, uh, other consultants, and they're all billing by the hour, um, by the minute, really, by the by the tenth of an hour is, is the is becoming the new norm. And each person that's billing by the hour can be hundreds of dollars per hour. Uh, some some accounting and law firm partners over a thousand dollars an hour, uh, and and that's just the the humans that are that are working on this and and the um, renegotiation costs. You can have, you know, you can have uh, if you're if you're dealing with a floating rate loan, um, you know, those those fluctuate all over the place, and you can have some unforeseen. Differences in, in your costs of funds, you know, you might enter into a, you might have to enter into a swap agreement with with someone else to kind of take the that floating rate risk off the table. Um, you know, the maintenance issues in the aircraft can arise, uh, and and you know those may or may not be covered in the documents. They, they might bring you back to the negotiation table. Uh, you know, revamp the purchase price, things like that. Um, so it can be it can be as as calculable as additional billable hours for the humans working on the deal, but it could also go as far as completely, uh, you know, resetting the 
the costs negotiated in, in the deal. And sometimes deals can fall through because of because of you know some some principal agent and third party trust problems. And then you're you're completely out all of those costs because the the deal's not going through and you've just wasted everyone wasted everyone's time. Wow. Yeah, that's that's crazy. So we have this like we have this process that's inherently complex. And I think the article kind of lays out this idea of trust and how the need for trust has made it necessary for third party intermediaries like escrow agents um, and, and like legal experts, tax accounting experts and, and so on and so forth to be involved in the actual process. Right. Um, and I can think of a lot of different industries and situations where this idea of trust equates to you know, the, the needing to really hire third party intermediaries. Um, what would you say is kind of like the primary problem associated with this kind of a solution of hiring inter- intermediaries to guarantee trust? Yeah, so the the primary and, and obvious problem is when you need a, an intermediary, a third party to be uh, a ostensibly independent, you know, whether mediator or or kind of a facilitator of the transaction, you're bringing on an entire new basket of you know incentives that aren't maybe necessarily aligned, uh, risks foreseen and unforeseen, um, just just costly frictions. So, you know, in in these sorts of international deals, you have a lot of issues with uh, banking hours and you know whether. Closings will be live, or you know the purchase price will be paid when title to the aircraft is transferred, or you need to pay in advance. And what happens to that money between the time you've paid it and closing? You know how soon does it need to be returned if closing doesn't happen? There's there's a, a lot of uh, you know intricate issues with with money there, and often you use an escrow agent or a bank asking um, acting as escrow agent to to hold funds while some of the you know, um, conditions and eccentricities of closing are, are completed. And, you know, escrow is um, a, a very uh, intuitive concept for those that are familiar with blockchain. It's, it's a very clear use case in that uh, it's a, a third party in blockchain's case, a contract um, holding funds to be distributed upon conditions met or returned if not met. And, you know, in in the meat space world, when you have an escrow agent, that's a that's a company or or a person or a bank that has its own uh, has its own risks that come along with it. It can be extremely expensive. You know, I, I've seen um, well into five digit uh, escrow fees for holding money for less than twenty four hours. It's it's wild, and you know, it's it's really come to the forefront recently because there's a there's a pending case in in the U.S. Um, of this escrow agent who's who's uh, been accused of um, various various crimes, but <laughs> most, possibly most notably conspiracy to commit drug trafficking by their um, sort of facilitating of of uh, you know certain uh, structures and, and titling regimes to kind of mask who the ultimate owners of aircraft are. But but the the long and short of it is this this escrow company has hundreds of millions of dollars which are now frozen because the Department of Justice is carrying out uh, this this action against them. And you know you have clients that are like I you know I didn't know this I have nothing to do with this I, I need I want my money back but that money is with a, a trusted third party and and this is the, these are the kind of manifested risks risks that come when you have uh, a meat space inter- intermediate or, um, intermediary like this. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's that's really crazy too. I know that the article talked a little bit about like you know the possibility for fraud and stuff like that. Um, but I guess like you know the idea that like anytime you have an entity that is handling like large sums of other people's money, um, like money laundering becomes like more of a risk, right? And I think it's really interesting you just mentioned um, like you know trusted third party intermediaries because you're right like the entire idea behind this these escrow agents um or you know it, it, any of these uh like third parties really like is that um you you trust them with uh you know kind of being this objective source and so, um you know it really kind of goes back to that central theme of like how how much does trust really cost Right, especially when you start calculating risks involved in that 
Um, that's a very interesting point that you just made. So, um, so let's let's walk through the idea of smart contracts. How do smart contracts solve some of these problems inherent in, in big, complex business transactions like this? And also just kind of like a, a really broad overview, really fast of like, what is a smart contract for, for those who are not really blockchain savvy that are listening in right now? Sure. So, you know, a smart contract is is a self-executing um, deterministic agreement um, via code. So uh, that's a terrible shorthand definition, but you know, API three is all kinds of materials on on them out there to to kind of help elucidate that. But um, how smart contracts address these problems, you know, there there are a couple of very clear ones right off the bat. The first is twenty four seven execution. You know, a lot of these international deals fall victim to local banking hours because you have to get you know wire confirmations from local banks or intermediary banks as you're you know if you're closing something in in you know. Asia, but you're financing from London, it is all, all kinds of issues come up and you're constantly dealing with these moving schedules with the airline's flight path if you need to close in a certain jurisdiction, but it has to also be within the banking hours of, of your financier. It's, it's constantly a, a, a dance that just costs more and more money. So 24 uh, seven uptime and execution is huge. And, you know, you can, and a, a lot of, uh, practitioners out there aren't well versed in the concept of stable coins and like not necessarily needing to expose yourself to the volatility of digital assets to use this technology to, you know, transfer money any time of day. Um, and the, the second is, is just removing the, the third party, uh, meat space risk that, that we were just talking about before. You know, when you have, um, a smart contract that asks is escrow whether, it can be as simple as the the purchaser sends funds to the escrow contract, and then when both parties confirm that the conditions are all satisfied and they're ready, ready to close, the money gets remitted to the seller. Or if it doesn't close within a certain amount of time, it automatically returns it to the purchaser. It's a, it's you know a pretty simple implementation, easy to wrap your head around. That just doesn't meaningfully exist in the meat space world right now. You know, escrow agents typically have um, a pretty clear um, direction standard in the documents, you know, like if we receive direction to do something, we do it. Uh, we don't need to undertake any other investigation. Um, and in smart contracts, it's boiled down to code and, and calling functions and, and it's, um, much more transparent. Um, and it's, it's automated in a way that removes or at least seriously mitigates a lot of those third party, uh, trust risks and costs. Yeah. That's cool. That's really cool. So basically, a smart contract is just like an automated way. Um, it, it automates certain factors about the purchasing process. Um, what about like the set of conditions that are coded into these contracts? What are some examples you can give? I know that, you know, a lot of the times I think that there's this like um, conceptual, you know, blockage where it's like, uh, well, you need some inter intermediary in that process. Um, and, and so I think that it's kind of important to call out, like, you know, when you're doing something with a smart contract, it doesn't necessarily totally remove all intermediaries. It doesn't automate every single aspect of business, um, but it, it does just the right amount of things that it can be extremely uh, valuable. It provides a, a big amount of utility. Um, so can you give us kind of like a high level of like what a smart contract might look like in this space, um, you know, that, that would be actually realistic? Right. So um, you, you would want these smart contracts to execute based on factual conditions and, and you know, n nothing subjective. Um, not that that would really be able to be coded anyway, but uh, some some easy ones that jump out are uh, you know the the standard um, very simple escrow contract I mentioned before where you can have escrow um, either remit the escrowed payment to seller when purchaser and seller have confirmed all their conditions are satisfied in in their meet space documents um, but other factual conditions that can you know trigger closing and release of escrow. Uh, and a really obvious one to me, because this is one that I have waited on many a time, is the physical location of the aircraft. Um, it's 
very, very often that you have um, escrowed funds or funds that are already sent to seller with a refund letter saying the seller will refund the money if closing doesn't happen. Um, so everything's in place. It's just that the aircraft is not in the right jurisdiction to kind of optimize for regulatory issues or tax concerns. And a very popular one is to close over international waters, uh, you know, to kind of mitigate these these tax issues. So you could have a smart contract that, um, you know, calls a calls an API, a flight tracker API or something similar. And when it receives a response that the aircraft is within the, the right jurisdiction or over international waters, um, funds are remitted, signatures released, deals closed. Um, that would be, you know, that's a that's an implementation I've had in my head for several years now, and I have the very poor code on GitHub to to prove that. But um, so aircraft location is a good one. Um, another good one is uh, simply time. You know, time is is a factual condition. You can say that um, you know it it might not be as directly relevant to this this kind of transaction, but you can have an, a contract execute based on um, you know how much time is, has has occurred. Um, you know whether that's return of escrow or anything like that. Um, and you can also base a lot of these. Uh, more like recurring contracts on on rate conditions. So um, I mentioned earlier that sometimes financiers or lessors will enter into swap contracts to kind of mitigate their interest rate exposure or, or volatility to rates if they have a floating rate loan to purchase an aircraft. So you know you can have an um, uh, you, you can automate that as well. Um, you know you can you can use a a um, external function for pricing data. Um, you can, and which can incorporate all kinds of things if the parties have negotiated. You can incorporate fuel prices and you can incorporate other market data. Um, all kinds of interesting things that you can come up with, which otherwise are going to be hand calculated by expensive, um, humans <laughs> today. So there's a lot of, uh, very interesting ways that factual conditions can be codified and um, used to execute um, agreements in, in a more automated and uh, cost-effective and secure way. Yeah, that's so interesting. Yeah, it's. I think some of the issue with um, you know, like the the community at large, the business community at large, with trying to kind of understand smart contracts is that they're so versatile, right? Like they they really can do a lot of different things from just release these funds when these conditions are met to very complicated, um, you know, use cases that involve data points from a lot of different industries. Um, so it's, it's very, it's a very like versatile um, technology solution. Um, I think you did a great job though of, of really kind of like boiling that down for us. Um, that makes a lot of sense. So, so basically, a smart contract allows for a predetermined agreement to be executed based on this factual data, and then therefore it automates the oversight process altogether. Is what you're kind of saying. So, um, obviously, no two, two transactions are the same. How likely would it be that these contracts, you know, can just be like created ad hoc as needed based off of you know, the, the situation, I, cause I would assume that, you know, especially in aviation finance, there, there would never be a one size fits all solution to a smart contract. Right. 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 That's right. Um, however, you can, you can certainly ossify the, the basic, um, contracts and use cases. Like if you want a basic escrow, um, that I, like I've mentioned before, if you want a basic, uh, swap, or if you want a basic, um, you know, Let's say uh, there, there's a concept in, in aviation maintenance reserves where you need to have a certain amount of money on reserve or um, periodic maintenance uh, overhaul, things like that. Um, you can certainly sort of ossify the basic building blocks and then use them from there or incorporate them with uh, you know the traditional agreement process. However, another um, um, characteristic of aviation finance and a lot of other bigger industries is that you, you really have a lot of major players that work with each other pretty often. And in representing all sides in these transactions, you know, I, I am frequently conflicted out of, of deals because I'm, I've represented the other person or I'm currently representing the other company. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty small, um, 
you know, relatively small sphere. And when you have prior dealings, it's very, very common to use um, precedent documents, so prior agreements to to form a new transaction. So you have sort of the basic building blocks already agreed upon, and that's easily, um, you know, analogous to how a smart contract um, if I <laughs> transaction could be used as well. You know, you could say, you know, we're we're using uh, these docs from this prior deal. We'll use this closing process um, using these uh, automations that we've done before because we're comfortable with them because this deal, uh, you know, has the same sort of basic framework that that it makes sense to do this. And, you know, we don't need to, you know, let's say audit them again because, the, you know, they're tried and true and, you know, we're comfortable with them. We've used them. So it's it's kind of similar to how, um, you know, today it's it's very common to say, let's use the docs from, you know, this deal three years ago and just update it where we need. Nice. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So basically you just have like the skeletal structure or template of, you know, all the different factors and then you input, you know, what's unique about this, um, you know, each time that you're doing one of these transactions, that makes a lot of sense. And there, there are a lot of, different ways in which um, that is kind of performed already in numerous industries, right? Like I'm, I'm thinking of like accounting audit and stuff like that. Uh, so, so, you know, one of the problems I think in the blockchain space is general as I see it in, in general, as I see this, like, you know, this idea that all problems can be solved with technology. Um, you know, this seems to be a little bit more of a practical approach than making some outrageous claim, like, you know, blockchain cures cancer or something. And this has kind of been the central theme around, uh, you know, the, this article that we put together, you know, and, and what we intend to discuss ongoing, which is to basically underscore specific hypothetical use cases that could save time and money, prevent risk of financial loss, and also just showcase simple ways that like the technology in general can fix problems in a practical way. Uh, you and I have discussed this before, but what are your thoughts overall on how blockchain technology is perceived? And, you know, why why there seems to be a disconnect here between practical solutions in business and finance that that leverage blockchain technology versus this viewpoint that, you know, using the technology is just not a realistic solution to certain problems. Yes. So, um, you know, there are a lot of professionals out there that are very sensitive to buzzwords and and, you know, have seen mania before and uh, remember 2017. Um, so there is a lot of like, you know, that's all well and good. Who's going to really be a first mover in this? I'm not going to take the risk to, to do this first, you know, let some other, let, let someone else who's a little more, um, risk on to, to overhaul the way they do business. But the reality is you don't, you don't need to overhaul the way you do business. You, you can, you can gain a lot of efficiency, um, by incorporating even the most basic, um, blockchain solutions and smart contract implementations into the way you do business now. Like, um, you know, there's a growing, a growing trend of, of financings and, and investments in the traditional sphere using stable coins, because for a lot of the reasons I mentioned before, 24 seven, virtually instant settlement, no intermediary. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's an, it's an easy onboarding and, and, once you have some experience with the, the simpler implementations, you realize, oh, I, you know, I really don't need to completely overhaul um, my infrastructure and, and, and how I approach deals and, and, and things. There are ways for serious marginal efficiency boosts and, and cost cutting, um, which are, you know, iterable from there and, and can kind of improve our processes. So uh, I think it's, it's, uh, more needs to be emphasized on the sort of spectrum of how you can incorporate blockchain technology and how it can help your business, how it can help the industry. Um, whether it's, uh, you know, some of the things we've talked about in this interview, those use cases, um, whether it's, uh, sort of like a, a, a trustless, uh, recordation, um, platform for agreements or, uh, you know, maintenance, um, overhauls, uh, schedules. I mean, things like that, that um, back to birth bills of sale where you, you want a um, authoritative record of events that have happened in the past. And, and right now, these these records and, and these events and these documents and signatures, they're being hosted by some third party that has different incentives than you. 
and uh, you know you're you're reliant upon someone else's record. Um, sometimes it's you're reliant upon your adverse counterparty's record of a of a transaction, or and it's 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 not ideal. And um, the, the other thing I would say is that you know this this industry, uh, aviation specifically, but also a lot of others, a lot of also a lot of others. Um, uh, you know, all recognize the benefit of things like electronic signatures. And um, we're still, uh, you know, a little hesitant to kind of, you know, fully adopt them until you had, in, in aviation's case, the FAA start to accept electronic signatures for their, their filed documents. But um, this is all to say that uh, it, it, you, you don't need to wait for uh, someone else to do this first just because, uh you're afraid of it. Uh, there, there's a there's a lot of very simple, um, concrete, well tested implementations that can that can help industry uh, succeed and, and help individual businesses really get an edge when when you're able to to tap into these. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I, um, you know, it's interesting because I, I think with like any new disruptive technology. Um, you know, there's like this kind of uh, transition between, you know, mass skepticism to mass adoption. And that that transition can take a long time. Um, you know, but when you consider like that, this technology in general is kind of just like, um, it's like a, a better way of doing the internet, but both like the internet and intranet, like private and public, right? Um, there's just so much opportunity there. And, and like you've been saying, you know, there, there's a lot of low hanging fruit. Um, and I think that that's kind of like an important aspect of why we're doing this in general um, is, is to kind of like talk to that. You know, when I first jumped down the rabbit hole of, of blockchain, um, you know, it, it really wasn't until I took the plunge and bought like a hardware wallet and started using like MetaMask and, and you know, Uniswap and stuff like that that I like really it like all clicked. Like I understood the technology. I understood what it does when you actually use it and you see how simplistic it is. Right. And how much it creates this efficiency in a, a highly complex, you know, uh, transaction like, you know, finance, um, any, anything finance, retail finance, um, you know, specifically though, it, it's like, it's eye-opening, and and you find that people who um, take that initial kind of plunge become like diehard about the technology naturally because it's clearly disruptive. It's clearly going to disrupt, in, in my opinion, all industries, um, and it's an exciting thing, right? Uh, because it will make things better um, in general. So. Eric, this has been an awesome conversation. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. As was mentioned at the beginning of this video, this is the first interview and a series of blog posts and interviews we'll be doing on an ongoing basis with various subject matter experts um, called Redefining Trust, where we discuss specific problems that arise in various industries, uh, how blockchain technology and smart contracts can actually solve a lot of these problems. Uh, simply by automating away the, the need for trust in some way, okay? Um, I am your host, Mason Burkhalter, and I'd like to thank you again, Eric, for your time spent on the article and discussing this at length with us here today. Thank you. Yeah, this was great.